Hey guys, welcome back, it's Ripe again, back with more family drama mother-in-law stories. In this video, my crazy mother-in-law finds out I have cancer and then demands I give her everything I own. Let's dive right into the video. The title story starts like this. It feels cliche to say this, but my mother-in-law and I don't get along at all. I've been married for close to six years and at the beginning of my relationship with my wife, I knew her mother was gonna be an issue. My wife took it in stride, assuring me that her mother was just excited to see her only daughter getting married, but during the wedding planning process, my mother-in-law had attempted to change the venue less than a week before the wedding, claiming that it was too far away from her house. Of course, of course, the venue did not accept the update because she was not the person who made the reservation, I did, and she then proceeded to call us daily until the wedding, claiming that we need to make it up to her in some way. She did attend the wedding, but afterwards my wife and I decided to put a healthy distance between her and when semi no contact. We made sure that she was aware that we had a child three years later and did try to have holiday get-togethers that included her with other members of the family. Some of these have been wonderful, others have if not, either way, we have found a balance that works for our little family. At the start of the new year, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. They caught it at stage 2, which is not too horrible, but it would have been easier to treat at stage 1. With the amount of treatment that I would need to undergo to prevent it from spreading and then the subsequent surgery to remove the tumor, I was told that I would likely need to take a leave of absence. The situation would be entirely dependent on how I felt during treatment, but at least for the initial few months it was recommended that I take time to focus on healing instead of work. I didn't want my wife to be overwhelmed with things in the house, especially since she has a child to worry about as well as her own job. Against my better judgment, my wife decided to reach out to her mother for help. I tried to look on the bright side, this might be a good excuse to begin to get back into contact with her and she would be able to help out my wife and get to see her grandchild on a regular basis. My mother-in-law did indeed come into our home when my wife asked her to, but while I was stuck in the bathroom for most of the first day due to chemo, my mother-in-law was speaking with my wife about what would happen after I passed away. My wife had to explain that I was not terminally ill and that most of my sickness was coming down to treatments I was receiving to make sure the cancer did not spread. That first day, my mother-in-law spent all her time just following my wife around the house, not helping but insisting that she was delusional and that cancer in any form was serious enough that she should have a will written out for me. That night we did discuss it since it would be a good just in case action should something go wrong, but my wife was not happy that her entire day was just her being alone with her mother and not getting help with anything around the house. I tried to have her give it the full week if things didn't work out or if my wife even felt more overwhelmed we would get my mother-in-law to leave and find another family member or friend to help her out. The week was a disaster. When my wife brought up the will, mother-in-law swooped in to tell her that everything I own should go to her if I end up passing away from cancer, which again I being treated, the doctors were very hopeful for a recovery within the year. The house, my savings, even my car should go to her and when my wife asked why my mother-in-law wants those things, she said that because of my cancer I don't deserve to have nice things anymore. When my wife brought up the fact that she is the one living in the house as well, along with her child, my mother-in-law made the excuse that she would make sure my wife was taken care of once I passed away, but that she was gonna be the one that will suffer the most when I am gone. Of course, I heard part of that conversation from my wife and from where I was resting a hall around the house, so we told my mother-in-law that she was no longer welcome since all she was doing was complaining and asking for things and not helping my wife at all. My mother-in-law was enraged that I would butt in on a conversation I am apparently not a part of and I told her that because she was in my house and speaking about me, I had every right to be angry with her and forbid her from coming back to the house. My mother-in-law decided that it was an affront to her and she immediately went to other members of my wife's family claiming that she was gonna sue us for pain and suffering for all of the horrible things we apparently said about her. Thankfully, my wife's family is very much aware of the relationship we have with her so when they said they didn't think she was telling the truth, she accused us of turning her whole family against her. I did hear that she tried to get a lawyer for her attempt to sue us, but I don't think it went anywhere. In the end, my wife and I went completely out of contact with her. I was able to start helping my wife after my treatment since my body was getting used to them quicker than anticipated. 
That also led into the operation on my thyroid being scheduled earlier and after about five months I've been told I was in remission and that there weren't any signs of the cancer spreading to other parts of my body. Because the surgery was scheduled earlier, I was able to return to work sooner than I expected. My boss and colleagues were more than happy to welcome me back and I was able to get right back into the thick of it. With my work on a new project they rolled out shortly after I ended my leave of absence, I was promoted and given a large increase in salary that I don't know if I I'd have gotten if I was still out. The day after my surgery, my wife told me that she found out she was pregnant with our second child. We are only a few months away from the due date, but our child is looking healthy and is growing well with each ultrasound we see. With the new member of the family on the way, my mother-in-law seemed to have found out about my wife's pregnancy and was trying to get back into contact with her. My wife refused though and had to continuously shut down any phone calls or unexpected house visits from her mother. When our second child was born, we decided that because I was getting paid more, we could afford to move and head to a larger house somewhere else. We didn't move far since I was still working out of my office, but the new place was much nicer, with a pool and enough rooms that if we wanted to have a third child, we could. With all that happened during my diagnosis, I wanted to have one last defiant act towards my mother-in-law, since she continued to try and warm her way back into our lives. I sent her a picture of our new house and a family photo of the four of us on our new couch with just a note saying that we are doing great. That seemed to be the last straw for her and she hasn't attempted to make contact with us since. Now my wife and I can truly enjoy having a family in our wonderful new home without someone else trying to control us at every turn. And if you enjoyed the title story, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, because we are getting very close to 130,000 subscribers. The next one is the revenge story titled Revenge on Mobile Home Park. I lived in a Texas mobile home park years ago when I was younger and woke up one day to find my car missing. When I called the police to report it stolen, I was informed that it had been towed. I fought with the park office and tow company on the phone all day, having to call in and miss work. I had time off accrued so I did get paid and they had towed my vehicle from my own driveway in the middle of the night. And well, it was not on the street or a broken down eyesore or anything that would warrant a tow, so I could not imagine what their reasoning for towing could have been. Well, the tow company claimed that I was partially parked on the grass, which was not allowed, and maybe half of my passenger side tires were on the grass, but I honestly don't think it was even that much. Anyway, the reason why my tires even touched the grass was because the driveway pavement was crumbling and deteriorating around the edges from age and the extreme Texas heat. So if you had two cars parked side by side, like my spouse and I did, one car had to be slightly on the grass because of the poor deteriorating condition of the park's driveway that was making it smaller and smaller with each passing year as grass began to grow up through the cracks and encroach over the edges. After getting absolutely nothing but a pathetic hostility from both the park office and the tow company, I called city code enforcement and got them to come out to inspect my driveway that same day. They found out that the driveway did not meet code which required it to be so many feet wide by so many feet deep. In fact, it missed these dimensional requirements by quite a bit after years of deferred maintenance. The inspector then went to the office to inform them of this violation. In addition, the code enforcer told the park office that they'd be doing an inspection of the entire park, 188 lots in the coming weeks and that the park would have to bring every driveway in violation up to code within 30 days or face ongoing penalties per violation until they were all fixed. This meant they were going to be on the hook for thousands of dollars in repairs and perhaps additional thousands in fines if they didn't correct every violation noted within the allotted time frame. So I got my car back from the tow company at the end of the day without having to pay any fees. Once I was there they gave me a restrained attitude and tried to make me just get my car and get out but I made a big deal about taking a dozen photos of my car from every angle to document any potential damage they may have inflicted during the tow and storage process. It was such sweet revenge. By the way, the park was a great independent place when we moved in but it became a glutinous monster once a national corporation bought them out. They went up every single year 4% on lot rent because that was the legal maximum I believe and they also stopped renting homes so everyone had to buy their homes from the corporation too if they wanted to stay in their rental home once their lease came up for renewal freeing the company from having to do repairs. And of course they raised the prices of the homes significantly more than what they were listed for if you opted to buy when they were still an independent park. 
Ours went up $5,000 from what we could have bought it for when we moved in and they were still independent but we had no choice other than moving after a single year of owning. So then we took a risk and did a private lease to own just for what we owed on the home with another couple that had poor credit and got out within a year after the towing incident. The couple turned out to be great paying on time and eventually after a few years fixed their credit enough that they were able to refinance under their own names. So it all ultimately worked out in our favor and we got out from under the ruthless, uncaring corporate monster. And the next one is a malicious compliance story. I, 34th male, had always been doing multimedia for my church for years and years. So displaying lyrics and creating PowerPoint slides are second nature to me. I was scheduled to take care of the multimedia this morning, so as usual I came and created what is needed. I set up all of the lyrics, bible verses and the slides that were sent from the speaker before I went to the restroom. When I'm back I saw the guy who usually plays the bass, Nate, but he wasn't on schedule today. He was having a conversation with another person behind the multimedia station. I went back to my station and started pre-displaying everything on the screen to make sure that I can read everything, so that is what I did before I noticed that Nate is looking at my station. Five minutes before we start, Nate suddenly asked what I prepared. I showed him everything, the lyrics, the bible verses, the slides, just to satisfy his curiosity. Side note though, I don't really like Nate for several reasons. So basically he believes in a lot of conspiracies people share on social media and when someone questioned him he argued non-stop. Most of us just try to avoid starting a conversation with him entirely, including me. Also whenever he is scheduled to play bass, he tuned his amps volume quite high, higher than the other musical instruments that I can feel the vibration every time he plucks his bass and the multimedia station is at the very back of the room. He is just super obnoxious. Apparently his obnoxiousness is at a high rate today because as soon as he saw the slides I prepared he said that the font size is too small. He didn't say it might be too small, no, he said it is too small. I told him that it's fine, it's the regular font size we all use week after week, but he wouldn't drop it. By this time, the service started but for some reason, he did not go to find an empty seat in the audience. So rather, he sat on a stool behind my station while I repeatedly telling me that the font is too small. By this point, I was listening to his font mantra behind me while displaying the lyrics for the singers. After a couple minutes I asked him if he's planning to sit with the audience and I kid you not, this is his response. OP, your font is too small you need to increase it. I cannot believe it. He is so fixated on my slide's font size that he's refused to leave me alone until I fulfill his wishes. By this point even the pastor's wife asked him to please have a seat in the audience in which he told her that it's better for him to sit there because if he sat in the audience he wouldn't be able to see anything. I had enough. Malicious compliance initiated while still controlling the displayed lyrics. I also edited the slides while he watched so I am multitasking. Mind you, the service has already begun so I cannot actually display the slides just to make sure. I increased the font so big that the slides look ridiculous. Before there were only 10 slides and one slide could contain 6 to 7 lines of 2 to 3 bible verses with a translation section below it, but now there are about 40 slides with 15 plus lines that contain only 6 words in each. I can barely fit the translation part and each slide could only contain one verse. It looked totally atrocious. After witnessing his destruction, he patted me on my back, gave me a thumb up and went to find an empty seat. I looked at the pastor's wife and even she shook her head. During the sermon it was extremely awkward. The speaker was having a difficult time reading from the screen because he kept on pausing after each line. I also have to switch the slides quicker than before because each only consisted of one verse which interrupted the speaker's pace. After 10 minutes, the speaker gave up and just read from his own Bible, which most audiences follow suit. I witnessed many audiences pull up their Bible app from their phone and just read from there. Even Nate. I texted Nate, why are you reading from your phone? I thought you wanted the font bigger so you can read from the screen. And in response he turned and glared at me slightly. After the service was finished, the speaker approached me and asked if everything is okay because the slides did not look like what I usually made. The pastor's wife approached us, was very apologetic and explained everything. Then we looked for Nate in which we couldn't find him in the crowd. I guess he was too embarrassed to admit his monstrosity. And now let's move on to the next story. It starts like this. 
And the next one is an Am I the A-hole story complete with a final update, so please watch until the end. So I, 28 female, have a niece, 16 female. She is my only sister's only child. Two years ago I married a very wealthy man, 34 male, and because of the pandemic last Christmas was my first one with my in-laws. Basically, my mother-in-law gifted me a coat that is worth more than $20,000. I saw her wearing it, asked her where she bought it and she said that it will be my Christmas gift from her. I did not know how much it was. I knew it was expensive, but I thought maybe $3,000 at most. I was visiting my sister last January when my niece saw it. She googled the brand and showed me how much it really was. I won't lie, I didn't wear it after that because I was afraid of ruining it. So last week I wore it while visiting my sister. While I was putting it back on to leave, I felt something go splat on my back. And then my niece started cackling and the smell of paint hit me. I was so pissed off while she was not apologetic at all. Her mom screamed at her and said she was grounded. Then she said she will pay for the dry cleaning. While I was in my car, still in shock by the way, I got an alert that my niece posted a reel, it was of her doing a prank on me, and she said, I'm gonna hit my aunt's 20k coat with a paint-filled balloon to see how she reacts. I saved it on my phone, sent it to her mom and told her that a week's grounding is not enough here. She didn't reply, but I saw that my niece took it down. It got less than 5 views by then. The next day I found out my coat cannot be saved so I called my sister and told her that her daughter has to pay it back. Well, we got into an argument and she said that they will not be paying it and if I wanted a new one I should get my husband to buy it for me. I think that they should pay for it, they can afford to, in my opinion they should sell my niece's car and pay me back my money. We did not reach an agreement so I told her that I will be suing and reminded her that I have video evidence that her daughter A did it on purpose for online clout and B knew exactly how expensive it was. People in my life are not objective at all. I have some people calling me an a-hole, some saying they are the a-holes for not buying me a new one and some so obsessed with the price of the code that they are calling me an a-hole for simply owning it and wanting a new one. So Reddit, am I the a-hole? And yeah, ripe stars, let me know what you think about this in the comments. I would say OP is definitely not the a-hole because demanding consequences for something someone else did does not make you automatically an a-hole. Obviously, the niece or at least her family needs to face consequences for this. Anyway, Reddit said, nope, not the a-hole. She knew precisely what she was doing and deserves to now learn exquisite consequences of her horrid actions. I do have to ask though, what makes a coat worth 20k? Doesn't matter for judgment, but I'm just morbidly curious. Comment number two, not the a-hole. The title had me leaning towards you being the a-hole, but then I changed my mind when reading the rest. Your niece is entitled as F. She looked up how expensive the coat was, showed you how expensive it was, and then decided to publicly ruin it for online clout. Absolute trash behavior. If I was her mom, I would ask you to take her to court because she obviously needs some serious wrist slapping. Respectfully, F your knees. Update to the story. So here's a quick update since the situation has been resolved. When my husband got home, I told him what happened and showed him the video. He asked if I spoke with my brother-in-law and I said no. All my conversations were with my sister. He said that he will take care of it. Now a disclaimer, I understand nothing when it comes to insurance claims and this is what my husband told me slash what I understood happened. So my husband talked with my brother-in-law, told him exactly what happened and showed him the prank video. Then he told him that the coat was injured and we will be filing a claim and submitting the video and we might have to file charges for the claim. He assured him that he would be dropping the charges, we don't want to send the niece to jail. Then he told him that one of two things might happen. After our insurance pays us, they will come after them. If their insurance pays, their premium will skyrocket. If it doesn't though, they might sue them and might get a lien on their house. My brother-in-law asked if there was a way he could pay us without involving insurance. My husband told him that that was what we wanted at first but that my sister insisted that they will not be paying us back. Apparently my brother-in-law was not in the know and he was very pissed off at what my niece did and my sister's response. So they came to this solution. My niece's car will be sold and if it doesn't fetch the whole compensation money, she will have to get a job and pay me the whole check until it is paid off. Also she is grounded for the rest of the school year. I'm thankful for the people who encouraged me to talk with my husband. And yeah guys, with this we have reached the end of the video. However, if you cannot get enough of my content, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel to not miss any of my daily uploads. And also check out my podcast by searching for Ripe Stories on Spotify, Amazon or 
Audible and other podcast platforms. You will often find exclusive episodes and early access to new content. Furthermore, please check out my Patreon by going to patreon.com slash ripe YouTube or my YouTube membership program for even more exclusive stories. Thank you so much and I will see you again tomorrow.